Well, it's the love of the Father, right, that draws us into covenant, draws us into relationship with him. Deuteronomy 7, 8 says, It is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of the Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. See, we're beneficiaries of the same promise. Through the work of Christ, it was fulfilled. So we are grafted into the family of God. We are now sons and daughters of the King because of Christ. So we can sing, Christ is enough. Oh, he is enough. He is faithful. He is steadfast. He is our reward.
God from whom all blessings flow in heaven above and earth below. Praise God the Father and the Son. Praise God Spirit, three in one. Truly is a marvelous thing, Lord, that we can pray to you, the Father, through the Son, empowered by the Spirit. We sang of your faithfulness not for a few years, not for a long time, described as a thousand generations, your faithfulness forever. Your faithfulness to your people, not your faithfulness somewhere else in a faraway place that we would view from a distance. Your faithfulness to your children, your faithfulness to Oak Hill. I pray, God, right now that if there's someone hearing my voice in this room or, or over the live stream that does not perfectly understand your faithfulness to me, as they would say it, that today would be the day of salvation. Your promises are clear. They're perfect. We anticipate that Keith will make your promises more clear in the message. And um, yeah, we anticipate that. Father, I also want to pray for um, the mission trip that's going on for, with some of our leaders from our church um, and other leaders have gathered. And as they study your word, work together and understand more about church leadership we just we pray that you're doing a mighty work there i pray that those leaders would even many years from now if you tarry would look would look back to to this time and to this weekend and and uh I'd say yeah it was that was a good time of growth that was that was a huge encouragement that still goes with me today and as our leaders come back to us uh the day would be changed uh, more empowered, more full of faith, more more anticipating and understanding and knowing and operating out of the goodness of a perfect God that's faithfulness forever. So we thank you for all these things and we consider it a great honor and a great privilege to come before you in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. So part two, I need everybody that's participating in this coming weekend's youth retreat to come on up front here so leaders and students uh yeah that's you too don't be hesitating all right we're going to pray for you guys this is a pretty big group i would say oak hill has a has a uh position to impact at the youth retreat so I have vivid memories of youth retreats, and I'm 50 years old. So that's why this is kind of a big deal, because you guys are going to do stuff next weekend. Um, God's going to do things next weekend. More importantly, uh, hopefully you remember what he did and not much of what you did, uh, if that makes sense. And so we're going to pray to that end. Father, what an opportunity. Um, the big group here, where did all these people come from? And... Uh, they're going to go down into Maryland this coming weekend and they're going to have a retreat with uh, good worship time and with good speakers and with a lot of other kids that are at the same places and, and uh, face maybe the same doubts, challenges and struggles that, that, um, that we do and they're going to hear from you and you're going to speak to them and you're going to, you're going to do a work and uh, this is going to be a big time of growth we just believe it will and uh, we pray to that end uh, in faith lord and so i pray that you would protect every aspect of this weekend i, I pray that um, 
uh, that relationships would be encouraging. I pray that there would be physical safety, both travel and at the retreat. Uh, I pray that you would empower the speakers, uh, bless them real big, and and uh, that this would just be a time that where these kids would look back many years from now and say, like, my faith grew February 2024 because I went to the youth retreat. And I pray that for all the leaders and everyone involved. And we just, you know, we thank you for, for this great opportunity. And I, I just want to pray a blessing on these kids and leaders. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, thank you much. And we'll continue to pray for you this coming weekend. You can go sit down. Uh, do I have an offering intro, intro verse? Um, this is about five verses here, and it's packed real full the way Paul does. So let me set it up for you just a second. So Because I had to read it like four times before I got to drift. Um, the church in Macedonia was a small church and they were under severe affliction and they just didn't have much. In a lot of ways, they didn't have much. And God poured out his grace on them and they exceeded all expectations uh, in generosity to another need. And Paul was incredibly thankful uh, how God's grace enabled that to happen and how they responded to it. And I can tell you, O'Kill, your leaders are grateful for your generosity in many, many ways and, and the offering and, and in many ways. So um, picture that little church uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a hard time and how they respond to that. This is what Paul said. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, and I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Take the offering, usher. secret place where I see your face will you take me there again you can search my heart in the deepest part from beginning to the end to
that we would have a heart that is abandoned, that we would have a heart that is surrendered to you. Lord, we ask that, that we would allow our eyes to be lifted to you and to you alone, that we would see the life of Abraham, that we would see the life of Sarah, and that we would see the, their lives that were surrendered to you in trust, in obedience, and in delight of who you are. God, would you open our eyes to see the beautiful reality that we have the opportunity, that we have the privilege, that we have the time right now where we can see your love. We can see your love for us and that we would be captured by you. That we would be captured by your love and that we would be surrendered completely to you. Just as we sang, Lord, give us a heart that is abandoned so that we can be captured by the reality of who you are. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat this morning. Uh, welcome, by the way. Welcome to Oak Hill. If you're new with us here this morning, I want to personally welcome you. Uh, if you are a regular attender or a member, welcome. We are so glad to be together here and digging in God's Word. Um, I especially want to welcome our kids this morning because guess what? You get to stay with us this morning. And so I count it a privilege to have the opportunity to even have you as part of our message this morning. Um, it's an extra challenge that I get to be able to preach to you kids at your level, hopefully also. And so just uh, right off the bat, I want to say on behalf of everybody here, because you're all going to agree with me because I'm the one up front, uh, you have permission to, to move, to wiggle, to do what you need to do because you're kids, okay? It's okay, all right? I move around. I, I can't sit still either. So on behalf of everybody here, we understand. We'll show you the grace that you need this morning. Move around as you need, as much as your mom and dad permit you to. I think we're still a little hot here, Ken, so I don't know. I feel like I'm about ready to lose it. <laughs> I am Keith Martin, by the way. I'm a member here at Oak Hill. Our leaders, Pastor Ben and David, who usually are preaching, are on a missions trip. And so continue to pray for them. But the elders have asked me to step in and preach this morning. And I am more than uh, privileged to be able to do that. And so let's dive into God's word this morning together. Uh, turning your Bibles to Genesis 17. We're continuing in our series of origins as, we st as, we, as we've been on that journey. Does it still seem like it's like close to feedback to anybody else? Okay, all right. I'm just hearing something behind me. I don't know. Is, are the monitors on? Is some, something seems hot behind me. 
Are we good? Okay. All right. All right. I'm just going to ignore that, whatever I'm hearing then. So, all right. So let's jump in our Bibles to Genesis 17, and we will be reading that text here shortly. We have a big text to cover this morning, and so we're going to chunk it up a little bit. Uh, but before we get going, let me introduce it this way to you. Uh, there's a story um, that maybe some of you are familiar with. Some of you maybe even were familiar with just this past weekend, as I know some of our girls gathered together to watch this particular story. A story of at Christmas time where there was a family of four young ladies that were anticipating Christmas um, and were anticipating it even in the midst of, of the, the drudgery of life right then. It was through the Civil War season. Some of you know this as the classic novel, The Little Women. And these four young March girls are waiting, anticipating for their mom to come home so that they can enjoy brunch, so they can enjoy Christmas brunch. Even though times are tough and there's not many gifts and not many presents, they are excited and anticipating just being together. Their dad's off at the war, and, and mom finally comes home. They embrace her. They're excited. They're wishing each other Merry Christmas. And suddenly they begin to realize that there's something in their mom's eyes that isn't right, something that's troubling her, something that's on her heart. And so finally she begins to reveal that she had just been visiting with this very poor family just a few miles from them, and they have nothing and while the March kids have little on their, their own selves, um, this family has literally nothing. And she says, girls, could, could we pack everything you have up? All this food that we were expecting and ready to enjoy. Could we pack this up and could we bring this over to this family to bless them today? And probably a little reluctantly in their hearts. But yet they decide to obey their mom. And they gather the supplies up and they march through the snow and they get to the house and they see the broken, torn down house. They see the ragged clothes of the children. They hear the crying baby and the mom who looks like she hasn't combed her hair probably in months. And they, in great compassion and love, follow the lead of their mom and they give this food to this family in great love. They did all this because they, they saw what their mom saw. And they wanted to trust their mom. They wanted to obey their mom. They wanted to delight in what their mom wanted to delight in. They wanted to surrender what they thought was rightfully your, theirs, and they wanted to surrender it over to this family. And this morning, I want you and I to see the very same thing can take place as we look at an almighty God who loves us so much, just like we sang about. An almighty God who we need to turn our eyes to trust in everything of him. Turn our eyes to trust him by obeying him, by delighting in him, because he is the almighty God. And so this morning, that's the big idea we want to look at. We want to look at the reality that we need to trust God, that we need to surrender our hearts in trusting God by trusting him, obeying him, and delighting in God Almighty. Would you follow with me as we begin here in chapter 17, verses 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham, and he said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. We're going to stop there for right now. We'll jump back into the text here just in a little bit, but we're going to stop there. And the first point we want to look at is that we need to trust God by depending on his promises. We need to trust God by depending on his promises. Right off the bat, we see um, a, a couple things. We see that 99 years old, um, Abraham is at 99 at this point in life, and therefore we can see 13 years has passed. 
Uh, we looked at Ishmael, the story of Ishmael, the story of Hagar uh, last week, and we can see that there's been 13 years that have passed. Uh, Ishmael is now 13 years old. We're going to see that later in the text also that confirms this. This is a 13-year period that's, that's passed. And God suddenly again appears. It seems like God hasn't appeared to Abraham over that period of time. Um, and, and so suddenly again, here is uh, Abraham and God in community with each other here. God appears. But God also tells Abraham something specific as he appears to him. He says, I am God Almighty. He's not just, just a God. He's not just some God out there. He specifically wants Abraham and he specifically wants you and I to recognize as we go throughout this text this morning that he is El Shaddai, God Almighty. Kids, you'll remember when I, when I used to teach you in preschool before you're up to the level you are now, right? We used to sing that song, our God is so, what? So big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do, right? That's the almighty God that we're looking at. El Shaddai, Shaddai could mean, could be interpreted as a mountain, right? Uh, what's the purpose of the mountain? A mountain is mighty, it's strong, it's big, it's majestic. That's who God is, but so much more because he's the one who even made the mountains. So he is God Almighty, not just God of a mountain. God Almighty, El Shaddai. We also see in this that God makes some promises here with Abraham. He has this covenant word that we see. And some of us are going to say, wait, didn't we just didn't we cover that like a couple weeks ago in chapter 15? Correct, we did. There is, God made a covenant with Abraham, with Abram at the time. He made this covenant and he is reaffirming and he is uh, reminding him of this covenant. Something significant has happened between this and the covenant. And that's, Abraham made a big mistake, right? We see in, in, verse, in chapter 16 that Hagar and Abram, and you can go back and listen, you can go back and read. There's a big sin issue that happens here in Abraham's life. And God wants to reaffirm and re remind Abraham that that commitment, that covenant has not been broken because of his sin. Because God unconditionally gave that covenant to Abram and he walked through by himself as Abram was asleep, if you will remember in the text. He walks through, he's unconditionally making this promise to Abraham. But as we get to this text, we may begin to ask the question, is this... Still an unconditional covenant? Or, or is there conditions all of a sudden that are applied? Because it says to Abraham that you need to walk blameless before me. Even later in the text, as we're going to read here shortly, we see that there's this circumcision element. Are these things that, that God is saying, like, now, now my covenant no longer is unconditional, but is conditional? Let, let's explain those two words real quick. What does unconditional, what does conditional mean? What is a conditional covenant? A conditional covenant is this. A conditional covenant, uh, kids who are going to the youth retreat next week, most likely um, either you or your parents, I forget how the whole system works, but there's a signature that's applied to this covenant that you make as you go to camp, to the, to the winter retreat next weekend, that commits that you are going to follow the rules of the retreat. Uh, one big rule that I love is that there's no cell phones. No cell phones for kids, okay? Okay. Um, no weapons, obviously, no boys and girls cabins, no girls and boys cabins. Like some things are obvious, right? But they have to make those rules there. They have to want, they have to have you covenant with them in that so that if there is um, wrongdoing in that, that there can be discipline applied. You might get a phone call. Your mom might get a phone call. They need to come get you because you didn't follow the rules, okay? You broke the covenant. That is a, a um, conditional covenant that's made. Or maybe you think of a conditional covenant in the sense of, of your teacher and you as a student, right? Um, you have a conditional covenant. You do the work and you get the grade, right? There's a conditional covenant that's made there. Um, for some of you younger kids, maybe you can think of it like this. Like if mom says to you, um, once you clean up your Legos, you can come have dessert. And so you go to clean up your Legos and you get distracted and you start building a bigger tower and it gets bigger and bigger, and then you remember about dessert, and you go say, hey, mom, can I have dessert now? What's the first question she asks? Did you clean up your Legos? Right? There's a covenant. There's a commitment made there that's conditional. You'll get dessert conditioned on the fact that you clean it up. Now, let's look at the thought of unconditional covenant. 
An unconditional covenant is this idea. Uh, kids, just imagine if you went to a class, a new semester starts, you sit down in class, the teacher gets up front and says, welcome to this class. I'm glad all of you are part of this. I just want you to know at the end of the semester in your report cards, every one of you will get an A. Okay, the kid that doesn't even pay attention in school is suddenly paying attention. Like, wait, I get an A? Just what for what? That's an unconditional covenant, right? That's an unconditional commitment that that teacher is applying to the student to say, you get an A no matter what. Now, the results of how the student might respond to that are probably going to be different, and we can get into the depths of that in another discussion in another place. But those are unconditional. That's an unconditional covenant. An unconditional covenant that we probably more often think of is marriage. We make an unconditional covenant when we choose to get married. We're saying for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, whether you're healthy or whether you're sick, we have covenanted together that we are going to love one another and we are going to stay committed in this relationship. Unconditional commitment, an unconditional covenant is a, is a parent to a child I choose to love my children because they're my children. Not because they've done something, not because they've done well in school or because they've obeyed me or because they're excelling at the sport that they're playing or doing great at the instrument. I don't love them because of that. I unconditionally love them because they're my child. And the same, and the reality is, that's the same for how God sees us. But while we think of unconditional commitments, unconditional covenants in that way in, in, in marriage and in our parenting, I want to acknowledge the reality that that's not always the case. Like, as humans, we live in this fallen world, and some of us have experienced what should have been unconditional love with a condition. And that hurts. And some of you are living in the pain of that, and some of you are living in the brokenness of that, and some of you are... are just trying to su survive because it hurts. And I want to acknowledge that because it's real. And some of you are facing that on a daily basis and you don't know how to live with it. And you don't know how to move on. You don't know how to put the next foot and step in front of the other for your walk. And that hurts. But there is a God who says he has made an unconditional commitment and covenant that you and I need to all look towards. Where man has failed, God succeeds. And so while we can argue whether this co commitment, this covenant is unconditional or conditional, there's one thing I can be sure of. That God doesn't put a condition, God doesn't put a condition on you and I that he will not fulfill. Let me say that again. God will not put a condition on us. He will not make a covenant with us that's conditional that he himself will not fulfill. Did Abraham walk blameless before the Lord from that moment on? No, we know he doesn't. Read on. Continue on with our series. But we do know that there is one who does walk blameless before. There is one who comes in Jesus Christ who walks blameless and who fulfills that covenant. And so you and I can recognize that there's an unconditional love of the Father, just like we just sang about, just like we just declared, just like we do every Sunday and every week, hopefully here at Oak Hill, just like we hopefully are doing constantly in our GCs together, as we're constantly living life together, that we are pointing one another to the unconditional love of our Father, God Almighty, the Almighty God, the one who can fulfill the covenant because he is the creator of all. See, you and I are the broken people. You and I are the ones that, as, as Paul says, our, our sin deserves death. The wages of sin is death. You and I have messed up, and we deserve to die. We don't deserve that covenant. We do not deserve that unconditional love. But God says, I love you, and I will fulfill it through Christ. And will you put your faith and your trust in that? Will you trust God by depending on his promises is the question. Will we trust God by depending on his promises? Let's continue on in our text, beginning here at verse 9. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. 
Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my commandment. Circumcision. What is the purpose? What is the reason for this? Why does God direct Abraham to do this? Well, it's a sign. That's the first thing we see. It's a sign of this covenant that God has placed between um, God and Abraham. It's a sign that needs to continue because God wants generation after generation after generation to see who, what his covenant is and the fact that he will fulfill it. This is written 400 some years later, most likely, as Moses is leading the Israelites out of, the Israelites out of Egypt. And they've been through lots of experiences since, since this happened, since Abraham covenanted with God. And so this pattern and this tradition was to continue so that every generation would be reminded of who? Of God Almighty, that that's who appeared to Abraham. And that's who's appearing to you and I and to the Israelites at that time. It's God Almighty. This is a sign. This is a sign that's to be passed among generations. This is an admission into the community. If, you don't cho- if, if they didn't choose to circumcise, then they were cut off, it says. They need to be circumcised as part of this community. The purpose, some of the purpose of this is to teach who God is to everyone in the household. The generations, every generation is supposed to hear of who God is, continuing to teach and to point to who God Almighty is. This is also specifically a sign on the very instrument that God is going to use to produce the promised child that he has promised. God wants Abraham to know that it is God Almighty who's going to produce this child that he's promised. And it's on the very instrument that Abraham has committed sin and the very instrument that God is going to use to produce the promised son. And he wants Abraham to know that. And he wants every generation after that to recognize that truth and that reality. What circumcision is not, though, is it is not salvific. It is not earning his salvation in this. It is not a salvation act. And we can know that even more specifically when Paul tells us in Romans, he says, how then was it counted to Abraham as righteousness? Remember back in 15? God credited Abraham with righteousness. It was, let me continue on in Romans. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but it was before. This is not a salvation issue. And in fact, some of you are sitting there thinking, well, what's the big deal? We don't even talk about this anymore. You're right. This became an, a huge issue after Christ. Because Christ had fulfilled the covenant, um, Paul and some others began to realize that this was actually not necessary, not needed anymore. And they got this big church conference. It was a big deal. And they came to the conclusion that circumcision is no longer necessary. It no longer needs to be the sign of the covenant. And so um, that's one of the reasons we don't talk about it a whole lot anymore, right? Right? But it is the truth and it it is the reality in what we see in our text this morning that it is a sign. It is a sign to point to who? It's a sign to point to the Almighty God. And so we need to be reminded of that. And we're going to see other ways in which God gives us signs later as we continue. Let's continue in our text beginning at verse 15 now. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face, and he laughed. And he said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, No. 
But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you, and behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you this time next year. When, when he had finished talking with God, with him, God went up from Abraham. Here we see that God Almighty has already said what he will do. If you have time later, I encourage you to go back through and just look at how many times God says, I will, I will, I will. And before all of that, he says, I have. Even before Isaac's been born, he already says, I have. Even before Sarah's pregnant, he says, I have. He will do it because he will deliver on his promises because he is almighty God. But in this section, we see this response of Abraham. We see God promise him all of these things and Abraham responds in this manner of laying prostrate before the Lord. And in the midst of while he is worshiping God and, and laughing even in joy of what he's hearing, he's also worshiping him even in the midst of his doubt. What does he say? What does he say? Oh, that Ishmael may be the one. God, it, it, it will be Ishmael. Like we, we're, we're done with, with any chance of babies. God, can't you tell that this is over and done with? Like, stop with that. We've got Ishmael. I love him, and he's my son, and this will work. Just, just follow what we're thinking here, God. Right? How does that work for him, okay? But here's what I want you to see in this, right? The moments of our doubt and the moments of our pain and the moments of the times that we want to question God are the moments we need to be the lowest before the Lord and worshiping him only. Because my tendency, at least, me personally, my tendency when I want to doubt God, or when I'm not wanting to trust in God's plan, when I don't want to look at the Almighty God, I want to do the thing of going to hide. I want to go do the thing of my own and try to forget about God. I want to try to ignore the plans and the promises of God. But what's Abraham do in the midst of his doubt, in the midst of all of that? He's worshiping God and allowing God to correct his thinking. And that's the same for you and I. In the midst of what pain you're going through right now, in the midst of what you're suffering through right now, in the midst of your questions to God of why, God, why is this happening to me? Why am I where I am at? Why has, has this not happened yet for me? Why does it seem like everything's against me? Those are the moments you need to get the lowest before the Lord and worship him alone. And allow him to correct your thinking. And allow him to lead you back to the reality that he is God Almighty. That he is the creator. And he is the maker. And he is the sustainer. And you need to trust in him. You need to depend on him. Not on yourself. For some of you who are reading maybe from the NIV. I just want to clarify something that's a little confusing in this text. And I don't fully understand it. The NIV is the only translation that does this. But they use the word yes instead of no. That seemed, everybody's probably already like, huh? What? Why would they say yes? God says yes instead of no in the NIV. And the reason he's saying yes is he's saying yes to the promises of Ishmael. To, to giving Ishmael a blessing. And in it, they say yes, but. Similar to what your translation probably says in no but. All right? But it's a yes, but... The full fulfillment, the full covenant is on Isaac. I will bless Ishmael, he says. And that's where the yes comes from. So if you're confused by that, hopefully that helps clarify it. They're the only translation that even uses the word yes, and don't ask me why. But hopefully that helps clear it up for you if you're looking at NIV this morning. Because that could be very confusing. In the midst of our pain, in the midst of our doubt, we need to turn our eyes to trusting in God. In a song by the afters that says, I will fear no more, they write these words. God, you are my courage when I'm in the worry of the dead of night. You're my strength because I'm not strong enough to win this fight. You are greater than the battle that's raging in my mind. I will trust you, Lord, and I will fear no more. 
Let's be a people that is trusting God's promises by depending on him. Trusting on God's promises by depending on him because that's going to lead us to faithfully obey God's promises through devotion to him. Let's faithfully, our second point here is faithfully obey God's promises through devotion to him. Follow with me back at verse 22. When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. And then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskin. That very day, as God had said, Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. And all the men of the house, those born in the house and those bought with the money from a foreigner, were born. Let us see that we need to faithfully obey God's promises through devotion to him. Kids, you may have heard your mom and dad say it this way. We used to use this phrase with our kids. Maybe now that they're a little older, we don't use it as much. But uh, the phrase goes like this. Do it all the way, right away, the happy way. Has any of you ever heard that before? Okay. All the way, right away, the happy way. That's what we see Abraham do here. Like, he isn't like, all right, let me check with a couple doctors. Let me see next town over how they do this circumcision thing. Uh, let, me, uh, let me schedule all these men that I need to, to, no, like he goes at it right away and he does it all the way. He does it the way God intended him to do it. He listened and he obeyed faithfully by devoting himself to the Lord, by trusting in God's plan. Might, maybe you've heard the phrase like this, immediate is obedient. Or the opposite of that, um, delayed obedience is disobedience, okay? All these different phrases we use for you kids to help you understand that obedience is necessary. It's necessary right away. You're learning that through your parents because you need to also learn that to obey the Lord. We've been talking a lot here at Oak Hill recently about our next steps of faith whether it's from Pastor Ben or David or from your GC leaders, these, this idea of our next steps. What is it that's your next step? What is the thing in your life that God is calling to you next that you need to put your faith in him and trust him and obey him in? Let's faithfully obey God's promises through devoting ourselves to that, through devoting ourselves to the almighty God who is the one who does it all. See, we don't take these next steps hoping that God's more pleased with us. Remember, the covenant, our salvation is fulfilled through Christ alone. It's not fulfilled through the next step of obedience that you take. God simply has given you that opportunity to take the next step because he wants you to be led to the place that he has for you that is the greatest and best place for you. And so devote yourself to him, trusting and knowing that he has better plans for you than what you have for yourself, just like he did for Abraham. Abraham's plan was Ishmael, but God said, I have even better plans for you. And so let's take our next steps. For some of us, that might simply be that act of baptism. We talked about this just last week in our second hour time together. Baptism is a, is a sign. Just like circumcision was a sign, this is a sign for you and I today. A sign that says we are committing ourselves to the Lord. That we are taking that step of faith. That we are identifying ourselves as being buried with Christ and resurrected again. Colossians 2 says, In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Now, some of you, I've heard this phrase used that we don't want to take the next step of baptism because we're just not sure if we're able to live up to that commitment. Well, if you, can't, if you think you can't live up to the commitment, then you're right. Because Christ is the one who fulfilled it. So put your faith and your confidence in Christ who fulfilled it, not in your ability to live up to it. 
So let's take those next steps. Whether it's baptism, uh, whether it's, it's modeling uh, the way of life for your children, instructing them in the things that God has called you to, just like Abraham needed to pass on to generations the truths. You and I as fathers, you and I as parents, you and I as believers are called to disciple and instruct those in our sphere of influence in the things of the Lord to point to the almighty God as the one who can do it. So stop pointing at yourself with pride when you have success and point to the Lord so that you're modeling it. When your kids do great, stop pointing to them and building up their pride and rather point to the God who's made them and who's created them and who's given them those gifts. Let's model, let's instruct ourselves and each other in the things of the almighty God because it's him who is doing it. The other element of circumcision that we see is the element, is the the reality that circumcision isn't all about the foreskin, it's all about the heart. Even in Deuteronomy, just shortly after um, Moses would have written this, he writes and he tells the people of Israel, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. He says later in Deuteronomy, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. This circumcision is all pointing to the fact that we need our hearts to be circumcised. Like imagine if I needed heart surgery and I went into the surgery procedure, I got into the room and the surgeon walked in and I said, Oh, I don't, I don't need you here. I can take care of this myself. I can figure out how to cut my heart open. I can figure out how to do the thing. I watched a YouTube video last night on it, right? (laughs) Foolish. Like there's no way that we can circumcise, that we can cut into, that we can fix our own heart. How much more spiritually are we fools to think that we can take care of ourselves? We need to depend and devote ourselves to the almighty God who knows your heart and knows my heart better than anything that we can know. So let's surrender ourselves. Let's lay prostrate before the Lord in our doubts, in our fears, in our pains, in our anxieties, in all of it before the Lord, surrendering ourselves to him, the almighty God, who wants to cut deep into your heart to change your life so that you take the next steps that he's called you to take. Obedience becomes delight when we see that our obedience is not a requirement for my acceptance of God, but rather it's an overflow of my heart to him. It's an overflow of my heart's desire to faithfully trust and obey him because I see the almighty God's love for me and I want to delight in that. And so I long to be obedient so that I can delight in the Lord. Devotion to God from love and dependence rather than duty. Let's devote ourselves to God in love and dependence rather than duty. The last point we want to look at this morning is the delight in God's promises, acknowledging his desires. Delight in God's promises, acknowledging his desires. Follow with me here as we jump in at 18. We're going to read 1 through 15 beginning at verse 1 in chapter 18. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought And wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three say as a flower, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good and he gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and he set it before him and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. 
So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you, and about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. Yeah. <laughs> and all God's people laughed. <laughs> Delight in God's promises, acknowledging his desires. Again, we see God appear. We see God's appearance here. We see Abraham's response is one of quickly wanting to serve these, these men. Uh, we can, I, I can say in lots of confidence that we are quite sure that one of these people one of these individuals of the three is a theophany. It's Jesus himself. Um, Ben's going to get into uh, the next section next week, and you're going to see that two of the messengers leave, and one, the Lord, stays and continues to talk. And so um, I believe that we can be fully confident that this is an appearance of God himself. Uh, some will argue that it's just messengers. Either way, it's the message of God that's coming. It is a true message of God that's coming. And I would want to argue that, yes, it is Jesus himself. It's an appearance of God himself to Abraham again. And Abraham responds in worship. He bows down to him. And they don't say, get away, stop, stop. We're not God, right? They, the, God himself allows Abraham to worship him in this midst, in this moment. And we see the excitement of Abraham. We see that Abraham wants to serve these men well. And he wants to care for them. And so they quickly get things together. We don't know why it has to be in a quick nature. It could be that they've already communicated that they're on their way to Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and they're in a hurry to get there. I, I don't know. We don't know exactly. The text doesn't tell us. But for whatever reason, Abraham is in a hurry. And he also wants to honor and serve these men well. And so he gets things ready. And in the midst of all of this, as they're enjoying the food that's been prepared for them, as they're conversing, um, they begin to ask this question of, where is Sarah? And this should remind you of a similar time that the Lord says, where, where are you, Adam and Eve? Where are you, Adam and Eve? And it's not because he doesn't know where Sarah is. It isn't because he doesn't know where Adam and Eve is. It's because they're not at the right place. I'm convinced that what God wants Sarah to hear in this is that you belong right here with me because I want to deliver this message to you personally. I don't want you hiding in shame. I don't want you hiding out in your tent. I don't want you running from me. I don't want you to feel any shame or embarrassment because all you felt your whole entire life is this ridicule from everybody around you that you can't have children. I want you to feel the acceptance and love that I, your father, your unconditional love that you need in this moment. And so he really just wants Sarah there. Let's go back a little bit in Sarah's life. Just to refresh ourselves. And just to understand exactly what's happening here. In chapter 11. At the very end of chapter 11. We're told that Sarai is barren. That she cannot have children. This is the first mention in all of scripture. Of somebody who is barren. There is an emptiness. There is a void that is there in her womb. That cannot produce children. I'm going to stop there for a second, and I want to read for you a quote from uh, someone who I, um, it's an it's a audio quote, so it sounds a little different than somebody that's writing it, but a podcast that I enjoy called Knowing Faith, um, Jen Wilkin, Kyle Worley, and JT English. It's a wonderful podcast if you're ever looking for great ones to listen to, but she says in this, as, she's, as she, Jen Wilkin, in this text, she says, this is not a story we would apply to an individual's infertility issue. We would not look to Sarah's battle with infertility as some example that we are to follow because it is a story that has a bigger theme to do with fruitfulness and multiplication. The line that leads to Christ. So the point of the birth is going to be a miraculous occurrence for, for women here who have had pain in the experience of infertility. Jen just says this. She says, just exhale. Just exhale and just let this be about Christ. So I encourage you to let this be about Christ as you hear these words. So we hear that Sarai is barren in chapter 11. 
And we see that God then says, I will bless you with a seed to Abraham in 12. And that seed would seem to imply a child that she's going to have sometime. And then we skip on to 15 where where Abraham, Abraham literally says to God, like, I'm going to continue to death childless. And that's where God says, no, but you will have a child. And now he makes what was unclear, maybe implied that there would be a child, even more clear by saying, you will have a child. You will have a son. And that word continue to death is that, is, is that literal, I, I believe what Abraham is saying in that is my wife is close to complete death in the womb. Like, she is almost to the point where there is no longer a cycle of life, and that womb is just about dead, God, and you still haven't given me a child, so you better hurry up. And then, my, my view of this would be that Sarah gets to a point where it is completely dead. There is no longer a cycle, and that's why they choose Hagar. Not because it was right, but because they saw no other option. That doesn't make it right. It doesn't justify it. It was still sin. Hear me clear in that. But that was the only way that they saw that they could address this idea that God was going to give them a son. And so then in 1811, we come to this, to this word that Sarah uses where she says that the way of women had ceased. We know for certain at this point now that she has no cycle. There is no opportunity for life. How in the world could someone that has no cycle ever be able to have a child? It's not anything that's ever been heard of. And so she has no confidence in the fact of her flesh being able to provide a child. And she has every right to think that. Like what evidence does she have other than the fact that she should see that God Almighty has said something and she should trust in God Almighty. But does God condemn her for her questioning of all this? Does, does God push her aside in this and say, oh, how foolish of you to laugh? No, he just points out and wants her to recognize that he is God. And so he heard her laugh, even if it wasn't out loud, because he's God. And he shows compassion on her and love towards her to allow her to have that laugh. Doesn't make it right, but, she, but he gets it. He understands us. He loves us enough that he allows us to have those moments of doubt. And just like Abraham fell prostrate to the Lord, that's where, Era, that's where Sarah uh, should have turned also, was to worship the Lord. We don't know that she does or doesn't at this point. But what we do know is this. We know that one year later, God says he will return and they will have a child. He doesn't say nine months. She's not already pregnant. Like, there is faith that has to take place. There is faith in obedience that has to take place in the life of Abraham and Sarah for this baby to come. When she says the words, and I'll have pleasure, it really means pleasure. Like there has to be an event that happens that they will delight in that in nine months from then, they will have a child. This is the literal reality of Abraham and Sarah trusting God then obeying God, delighting, pleasuring in the things that God has made that are good and right so that he can produce the child that he has promised to be produced. See, this isn't the first time that God has taken what's empty and void and put life into it. He took the earth that was empty and void and had nothing in it and he took nothing and he made everything. And so Sarah should in great confidence, Abraham should in great confidence, realize and understand that God himself, God Almighty, can take what's empty and void in her womb and he can create life because only he can do that. This is one of the greatest stories ever that should have been, that probably and most likely was broadcast throughout every nation because God wanted to make his name great. Remember how the people wanted to make their name great at Babel? And he said, forget it. No, my name should be made great because I am the one who's created all of you and I'm the one who's going to divide you and divide your languages. And so in the moment of this miraculous birth, in the, and spoiler alert, she does have a baby Isaac and I'll let Ben get to that later, but we see the great reality of what God wants to broadcast in his name being made great because I am sure every visitor that had ever come through there heard about Sarah and the fact that she never had children. And someday all of those nations hear this story of a 90-year-old woman who gave birth. 
That is not possible other than the fact that there's an almighty God out there, the God of Abraham who did this and who accomplished this. And so you and I can trust that God. You and I can obey, faithfully obey that God. And you and I can delight in the pleasures of what that God has given to us to delight in as we obey him. And so let's turn and trust in those things. Let's, del- let's obey him. Let's delight in him. You know, imagine with me that you were, going, you were moving far away. And in order to move far away, you needed a home, obviously. And so you decided that you were going to build a brand new home. And so you contacted a builder and an architect and a designer in that area. And you said to them, hey, I need a home. Uh, here's kind of what I'm thinking. And together you form a blueprint and a plan that you all agree on. And you say, here's the, here's the deal though. I'm not going to be able to get to that house until it's finished. Like I have no ability to get there. There's no purpose in me coming until you have the whole thing complete and I can live in that house. And so for that year, The builder, the designer, the architect are working together to put together this house and to build this house. And throughout the year, you keep looking at the blueprint and you keep thinking about where you're going to put the furniture and where you're going to use the home and how you're going to use it well. And then the time comes for you to move. And you drive up to the house and you get there with all your moving stuff and you look and the first thing you think is something, something seems different than what I was imagining on this blueprint. And then you walk into the house and and you see this beautiful foyer entryway that you did not envision at all. And a staircase that goes, winds up the steps. And you think, I had just a ranch figured. What's going on here? The kitchen's wide open and full of space. You were expecting to be a little tighter than you hoped, but it was going to make do. A fireplace, warm and cozy with nice, comfortable spot to, to be able to enjoy just relaxing. You didn't have that figured in. And the questions begin to turn in your mind and you go to the architect and the builder and the designer and you say, this isn't what we planned. This isn't, this wasn't the plan. And they say, but isn't this beautiful? Isn't this wonderful? Isn't this even better than what you imagined? This is what you get for what you were expecting. Because you're going to trust the architect and the builder and the designer. The one who creates and makes it all has a better plan for your life than what you've put in front of yourself. And so walk in the things of what God has planned for you. In great faith and great obedience. Trusting that his house for you, that his life for you is much better than you can ever expect, you could ever plan for. And when you go to walk into that life and when you experience the things you're experiencing, you can experience them with great delight and great satisfaction because God has taken what he has made and he is using it to be, make something beautiful for you to delight in. In fact, the architect and the builder and the designer even want you to know that there was a lot of things that got messed up along the process. See, when man came in and tried to build it, they they built things out of square. They messed up over here. But we were able to use that, God says, to be able to make something even greater. In one of my favorite songs, the author says, God makes messy things beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're messy people. Guess what? Every one of us, we're messy people. But God makes messy things beautiful in his time. After the showers, look for the flowers and he'll make everything truthful, it says. That's right. He will make everything true in his time, in his way, when he wants to. And so believe the promises of God. Believe the reality that God has promised that he says he's fulfilled the covenant. And so therefore, you are adopted. You are forgiven. You are given a great hope in the fact that you are redeemed as you have put your faith and your trust in Jesus alone. And if you're here today and that's not your story, there's great opportunity for you to put your faith in the one who has done it all. The one who has fulfilled the covenant in Jesus himself. And so, put your confidence there. Put your faith there. Not in your work, not in your ability, not in your blueprint, but in what God has planned so that he can do the work. Let us trust God. Let us surrender our hearts by trusting God, by obeying him and delighting in all that he does. Let's pray. Lord, 
Would you turn our hearts to surrender to you? Would you turn our hearts to recognize that what you have said is true and the promises in which you have said we can believe in? Would you allow us in the moments and in the seasons and in the, in the reality of our lives where we are feeling so doubtful that we would just come and we would worship you so that you would remind us that we can trust you, that we can trust your plans better than anything that we can ever think of, better than anything that we can ever plan, better than anything that we can try to do on our own because you have great joy in doing what you have said you will do. Because you are the almighty God, we can trust in you. We can obey you and we can delight in you. And so we want to stand and we want to surrender our hearts and we want to acknowledge that it is all you, that you are the one who stood before creation, that you are the one who created it all and that you are the one who has made everything and therefore we can stand surrendering our hearts and our lives to you, you and God alone almighty. Amen. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before. cross for my shame my sin weighed upon your shoulders my soul now to stand so what can I say what can I do Offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So I walk upon salvation, your spirit alive in me, my life to declare.
So what can I say? What can I do? And offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. Pray with me, church. Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking that you would help us to stand surrendered. That we would completely get and understand and trust and believe that there is nothing that is too hard for our God. Lord, help us to not be in your way. <laughs> Help our plans to line up with your plans, Lord. May we never think that we know better than you know. And if you do nothing else in us today, Lord, may you convict our hearts of all those times that we know we get in your way. Lord, you are able. I believe. Help my unbelief. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And have a seat as we do a couple of announcements this morning. If you're visiting with us today, we're glad you're here. We did love to have you go back, grab a cup of coffee, visit the welcome table uh, where we have a gift for you. Uh, we'd like to invite you to consider Oak Hill coming up on March 3rd at 11 o'clock. Uh, you can sign up for that on a connect card at the connection table. Um, that's the time at Consider Oak Hill where we get to get together, get to know you. Uh, we get to tell you a little bit about Oak Hill and what we teach and what we believe in here. Looking forward to doing that on March 3rd. Um, we also have another celebratory thing to do today. I love, I'm privileged to announce that Hannah Erdvig is now an official member of Oak Hill Fellowship Church. Welcome, <laughs> Hannah. I look forward to when I get to do that on announcements, and I don't get to do it off and off. Uh, next Sunday, believe it or not, Pastor Ben should be back here and be in the pulpit preaching uh, as we continue in our Origin of Faith series in Genesis 18. Uh, on that note, just speaking of Pastor Ben and of David and of Katie, I've seen some pictures and some videos that they have shared through the Signal app and whatnot that have come through. Um, their prayer, just so you know, is that their time there and their teaching there, uh, they've been teaching and working on servant leadership, that the men and pastors there in India and the surrounding countries would be able to grasp what it is to be an under-shepherd, to serve and to do so with a heart understanding that God is in control and that they are only to be obedient to God and what he says to do. And culturally, that is tough, apparently. I would argue that it's not easy here in this part of this world that we live in here in Coryville either. So you can be in prayer for them about that. Uh, they look like they're having a great time, but probably have no idea what sleep looks like because they're upside down. They're like 10 and a half hours um, ahead of us. So add 10 and a half hours to your time today, and that's where this currently is right now in Sinai, India. Uh, we have reading plans. Uh, for our Origin and Faith series that I'd invite you to grab a copy of on the connection table. Prayer Summit, it's coming up on March 30th. I don't know about you, but during the holy holidays, if you will, life tends to get pretty busy. Uh, we're, we're doing a prayer summit right smack dab between Good Friday and Celebration Sunday for Easter on Saturday, March 30th. We invite you to sign up for that and to come prepared to focus on God and who he is and what he has done and how you can trust and believe and trust in him. Uh, there is a sign up there for you. I believe there's a QR code that you can scan right now if you'd like to to sign up for that. Miss Cheryl, I was told that I needed to invite you up here for this next thing, so come on down. <laughs> Chili cook-off. Okay, Chili Cook-Off next week. We have 60 people or so signed up. You need to sign up by Wednesday. Don't make me not have a seat for you. That would be bad. 
Uh, we do have 10 competitors, lots and lots. This is a blind tasting. If you are a competitor, please bring your crock pot downstairs between 4.30 and 4.45 so we can set it up. There will be no driving people to try your chili. It's a blind taste test. But anyways, should be a lot of fun. Uh, we will have the missions update right after, and we'll count the ballots while the missions update is going on and announce the winner. So hope to see you there. Thank you, Cheryl. This is always, the, the chili cook-off is always a fun time. Uh, we get to eat really well, which is always good. I mean, look at me. After all, we get to have fun with that, um, and we also get to celebrate uh, God's goodness uh, in that, in the people that uh, have been gifted to be able to cook and cook well. Um, we look forward to that as well. Gospel communities are coming up this week. We look to celebrate those uh, with every gospel community leader. If you look to find out who is meeting when, come and see me afterwards, and I will get you that information. Today is the last day. Um, technically, today is the last day that we're asking you for your recommendations on elder candidates. Uh, you can do that via that QR code. You can do it, uh, which will take you to an online. There's also at the welcome table, there's an elder selection uh, document there for you to read through with a little form on the inside that you can put a name on. You can come and see me afterwards as well. That's always an acceptable form as well. We value, uh, part of the leadership team here, we value your thoughts as to who could be an elder at this church, uh, and we take those things seriously. So we invite anybody to do that that hasn't done it yet. With that, knowing that God is more able than we give him credit for, it's probably easy for us to think that he doesn't love us the way he loves us. I got news for you. He loves you more than you think in a way that you can't understand but he loves you. So you are loved. Have a great day in the Lord.